OK, let's get started. So. What we're going to look at today is how to build community and improve communication using teams, and that is part of the ongoing professional development that's available over at Microsoft Learn Education Center. That's also where you'll be able to find all the resources that we are using today. So if you went to Microsoft Learn Education Center and you search for teams and communities, it will come up with various courses, but the lot the content has been borrowed from there and it will cover the same areas. It also is a great place for your own professional development or that of colleagues that you have in your organization. You can track your achievements. You'll be awarded and accredited as you complete courses, but also it helps you then to either improve the application of technology in your classroom or your role if you've not got a classroom role within the school uh, and help to use technology as another tool to ease workloads, improve communication, engage with others. There's lots of reasons why you might want to do that. A couple of the courses over there in Microsoft Learn that are of use and also this lends itself to contributing to that. First is Microsoft Educator. That is an entry level course. And though it says educator, I would say it's useful for anyone that works in an education organization. It introduces lots of common aspects of apps in Office 365. And then if you decide to take things a little bit further and go deeper with how to use those tools at your disposal, the Microsoft Advanced Educator fits in there. It's got two strands to it. One is 21st century learning design, which is transferable skills to be successful adult learners. The other is how to make more of teams. So today's course really helps with the teams pillar of Microsoft Advanced Educator and then borrows some of the bits from the Microsoft Educator course as well. If you find that you completed both of those, then you can go on if you wish to, to undertake Microsoft Innovative Educator Expert, which is a, a commitment where you have to submit a sway of work that you've been doing to show just how you're using technology to have impact across the organization. Later on in this session, I'll share a code with you that you can redeem and learn, and it will give you some experience accreditation for having completed this course with us today. So as far as the agenda coverage, we're going to look at community aspects of Teams. We'll look at just how it can be used in school and beyond school, how to organise them in the first place, and also how it spans not just the educational aspects, but also into pastoral and mental well-being. Then we'll look at some of the features such as how to have chats privately and set up meetings. We'll look at using posts in channels and also then aspects in class teams that support you either with in class work or out of class work. If you've had any experience of using it or you're currently dabbling with using teams in various forms, feel free to pop your experiences in the chat there and I'll come back from time to time and pick those up. But at the same time, it's an opportunity here to just understand a little bit more about Teams and how you can take it back. What I would say from the outset is that you probably won't want to use everything we're going to explore today and take the pieces that are relevant to you that you think would fit well with either the skill set of the staff or the types of people or parents you work with uh, and then take that back and implement things slowly bit by bit. Don't try to do too much in any sort of digital transformation. It should be planned. It should work its way across the whole organization, not preferably have just pockets of people applying something. So first of all, Teams is universally available. You can access it through a web browser. If you go to www.office.com and most modern browsers support it. So Edge browser from Microsoft, you can have Chrome from Google, you can have Firefox or Safari if you use a Mac or you can install a dedicated app and providing you've got permissions to do so in some managed school computers don't allow you to install apps and you might have to raise a ticket with IT support. But you can install an app on Mac. You can also put it on Windows and recently it's gone onto the Chrome store as well. So you're able to add versions on Chromebooks. The other way is that you can make sure that you've got access on a variety of devices. So it isn't just thinking about a computer in a traditional sense, it is additionally available on tablet and phone devices. And that's really important when trying to get pupils or students at home to engage with this. 
I'm not suggesting for one minute that the size of a mobile phone screen is adequate for doing a substantial amount of work. It's not, but it might be useful for looking at a homework, understanding what they have to do or watching a video that's linked for your team's work. So there is a place for it. However, it's not a complete solution, but also we have to be realistic that many families haven't got the money, particularly with the, the current austerity that's facing us to go investing heavily in, in a wide range of devices. So they may just have to use what's there. So Teams pretty much opens up any sort of platform. It's designed by Microsoft to be a single hub that connects everyone regardless of their role. And it could be that it's finance and admin departments. It might be the teaching and learning focused staff. It could be that you're in a trust and you've got trust central teams that want to link out with various academies or schools. Or maybe if you're coming to this from a secondary or a college perspective, that you've got a research arm to your organization. But everyone can be connected through that one hub. And that one hub is Teams. It also connects everything that you might use. So on the left, you've got all the Microsoft applications, those that have been more traditionally available in Office. It's got functions that we'll look at next about being able to chat and communicate easily with each other, but it branches out to Microsoft associated products at the bottom. So you might be using Flip as it's called now, it's been rebranded from Flipgrid. Uh, but on the right, Microsoft have really opened up Teams to allow you to bring in other platforms as well. So if you use Kahoot for questions in class, you can bring them and pin them straight right into Teams so they're all in one place. So there's an awful lot of scope, again, for everything to be connected. Before you get too deeply into using it, some schools attending today are starting from a blank canvas. So you've got two different ways of setting up Teams. You can either do it all manually and take the data that, for instance, might be in an MIS system, or you can use a sync tool and a sync tool like School Data Sync from uh, Microsoft will link up with your MIS system regardless of what it is, whether it's RM Integris or ESS uh, Sims or whether you're an Arbor or Bromcom, and it will sync data from your MIS system relating to your staff and your pupils, and it will help to then create the right type of teams for them, but also join them in and set the correct amount of permissions and so forth. So most people, as we move into a more digital cloud based world, are starting to use those types of platforms. And it takes away the drudgery of having to do this manually or if someone arrives and leaves, you're having to add them in or take them out. It's all done for you and it'll just be kept up to date by virtue of having your MIS system up to date. When you organise your team, depends on whether you are a primary focused educational phase, secondary or SEN or college. Traditionally, and I'll show you both, uh, you will end up with having a class team per physical classroom in school in a primary setting, but you might have it split up by subjects per class team in a secondary and then broken down by these things called channels. All channels do is they subdivide up teams, so they might be by particular years or sets within a subject. There isn't necessarily a wrong or a right way of doing this, but a thing to bear in mind when you're coming to structure your teams is to have the smallest amount of teams possible and not everyone, unless you're an administrator, will see all the teams available. But if you don't do something to tame the situation, you'll have an unwieldy amount of them available and people will just get lost in the mess. So it's best if you have a limited amount of people in school that can create teams and other people that are users of teams and then have a formal process. It's part of your transformation journey where you add them in or people have to request their creation and then they're considered not just somebody starts adding another team for any purpose they want. When you launch it, if you haven't launched it yet, it's best to have a phased approach. Choose either your digital champion staff that are feeling like they're most confident with uh, adopting and using technology, but also at the same time, think about if you've got a group of pupils or students in a particular year group that are going to be tech savvy or maybe they're older, so they're better able to cope with having this introduced uh, and then have them start to trial it and then roll it and cascade it through other years. How it rolls out will be different again for every different uh, school and who you've got with you. But the message here, just like don't try to use everything we're going to look at today in one go, is also don't try to use everything that you are intending to use in one go. 
filter it down slowly and surely until you've built it up and then everyone can uh, use it once. We're going to focus quite a bit today on class teams. However, I won't step over the wider organisation of how teams can work to build all to different types of communities in school. But with a class team, what you can do is get together all of your staff and your pupils or students, and they can work together in one place. And just like you've got a physical classroom, it can complement further still to give you a virtual classroom. And you may only use pieces of it, but the pieces you do use can add to your arsenal or your toolkit of strategies of connecting with the pupils or the parents that you work with to enable them to be successful for mental well-being, for pastoral care, for academic work. There's a whole raft of reasons why you might create a team. When you come to it, if you've got the correct permissions, and often at this point people check what permissions they've got, if you haven't been given permissions in the policies by your administrator, you will probably just see join a team with a code, which is the right hand box on the screenshot. If you've been given full permissions, you'll have the ability to create a team. If you haven't got the ability to create a team, you'll have to get that applied to your account. There's nothing that can be changed during this session, and that's normally by raising a support ticket for your IT company, whether it's Turnitin or another third party organisation. And then once you've done that and you click create a team, if you're making one, you'll get a pop up box and there'll be the four types of teams. Class teams are where you want to connect together children and adults as learners or pastoral reasons. For private learning communities, that tends to work best for groups of staff that maybe don't have a classroom focus, such as a trust team or governors and so forth. Staff teams work really well for getting together all the employees of a school that will have some link with curriculum and other is a bit of a broad brush catch all uh, and it will then encompass various parts of the first three teams which allow you to function. You'll need to give your team a name, a description, and then when you decide to create your team, you'll have to decide whether it's going to be public or standard, uh, uh, sorry, public standard, or it's going to be private. If it's public standard, it means everyone in your entire school can see it. Doesn't necessarily mean they can get into it because they'd have to be a member to access it, but they could request access if you create it public standard, or if you don't want it to be visible to the people other than those that you choose to make a member, it needs to be created as a private team and then nobody else will see that. I'm going to swap over and we'll have a look at just how exactly that is in reality. I'm just going to check if there's any questions while I'm doing that. There's nothing in there at the moment. Do feel free to chip in, ask questions or make suggestions if you've been using Teams in a completely different way. I'm just going to swap over and connect. So I'm using Teams in the browser today. The landing page here once you've logged into www.office.com looks like this as a member of staff your landing page might be your outlook email it does vary depending on how it's been set up in your school one thing to flag to you over the next month or so certainly you'll see this accelerate as we get into november office 365 as a name and a brand is being phased out and it's going to be called microsoft 365 and you'll see that at the top so there'll be new logos new branding not necessarily a, a substantial change, but you will see the feel of things adjusted as Microsoft brings Office and Windows into one item rather than having them existing in separate worlds. To get to Teams in the browser, you simply click the app launch in the top left hand corner and select Teams. If you haven't got it available there, go to All Apps and scroll down and they're arranged alphabetically and you can get to Teams. Pretty much everything we're going to do is fine and the browser and the app version have a lot of the similar functions. There is the odd thing which I'll highlight if necessary as we go through that are only available in the app, but there isn't really many detrimental uh, factors to consider when you're using the browser version. So here I've got some demo teams set up for you, but this would be fairly typical of somebody starting to get to grips with using teams across their school. So we've got a staff team and that would be for staff only and pupils and students can't get access. 
We've got a governor's team down there. I might have Governor Hub in addition or other, the other third party products. And Microsoft are realists. They know that you've got dedicated platforms which are there for the reasons. But you might also have a governor's team for things like holding governor's meetings if you can't get all the governors into one place. You may also have a trust team in, in addition. So if we went into the staff team, we won't spend too much time looking at staff team today, but you would create your staff team. And the first thing you've got down here on the left hand side, the vertical tab there and the options in the middle here uh, are linked to different functions. So here, this vertical tab on the very left is called the me space because they're things that relate to me that allow me to navigate teams and will get me into different functions and opportunities that teams offers me. We've got things here that we could use together, and that's the channels. And we'll come back and look at channels in depth in a little bit more time. But we've also got things we can use together across the top here, going from posts right the way across to home. So things we can use communally are called we space, and then things that I would use individually are me space, and they're on the left. When you create a team, you automatically get what's called a general channel created because there has to be somewhere to exist. In the general channel, you'll always get somewhere to post and have chats with each other and you'll get somewhere to create your and store your files. But then you can additionally, by clicking on here, add further channels. And that's where we were looking at uh, earlier. And that's where you can decide whether it's standard and it's available to everyone or whether it's private or whether it's shared as well, so you can have it shared with people in your organization. You give it a name and you give it a description. If it's if it's standard or shared, it will not have a padlock next to it. If it's private, it will have a padlock next to it. I must add, I am logged in as an administrator here, so I get to see even the private ones. If you were logged in as a standard staff member, you would only see the channels which have been assigned to you that you're a member of. But what you can do within your single staff team, and this avoids the clutter that we spoke about earlier, I've got one staff team, but I can divide it up by groups of staff or employees in the school. So if I've got my admin office team, they can have their own channel and in there they could be having their own discussions in the post section, which are not visible to the whole staff. Traditionally, all staff are put into the general channel. And then if you want to have discussions as a whole staff in the school and everyone should be privy to what's going on, then it might be something like we're going to have a Macmillan coffee morning. Don't forget to come along to the staff room, have a cake if you're on a diet, I don't know, have some fruit or whatever it is. Uh, but those sorts of notices could go in here. So that's another way of having staff notices which don't necessarily have to be emailed out anymore. They might go in posts and you can get notified of those posts because you can set teams to give you whichever level of notifications you wish, whether it's emailing you separately, whether it's pop up windows and pop ups aren't appropriate necessarily if you're a class teacher so you can configure your notifications how you like them. We look at how to do some of that configuration in another training session and that's available to sign up to on the turn on website. You could also have, for instance, a business manager channel and in there might be the business manager or the finance lead along with the head and there's some posts in there about budgets, but you could also have your files stored privately as well in these different groups. So you might have your Senko and a Send one. You could have a leadership team, which is private. Uh, and then you can have these separated discussions that are going on. So if I go back to the general channel, in the general channel, as I said, this is normally meant for all staff. And with all staff, what you can do is have those higher level short yeah. notifications going out. So morning briefing is an obvious one there rather than maybe having it on a notice board. It could be that we've got a new letter template for the school and I want all staff to use that in communications. But as well as that being there, you won't stop using email. But the general rule of thumb is if it's a short, snappy message, it can be used in Teams posts. If it's something longer that has weight and substance to it with paragraphs, then use an email like you always have. The beauty of having Teams is not just around communication. It can also be around using it for storing files. So you've got a files tab at the top and this can replace having shared areas on the server. Because this is files tab is in the general channel, I can then take everything that might be in the staff shared area from the server and I can upload it into here. 
So this then becomes somewhere that all of my staff can visit, even if they're outside of school and they're not with me. If they were working from home, they could be on the other side of the world. But what it allows me to do is make sure that we can get access to resources from anywhere. So it stops me having to have the need to remote connect into school. And regardless of time of day, and I'm not suggesting with work life balance that anyone should be working in the evenings. But if you had to, you can get to your resources and it's not the end of the world if you're at home and you don't need to get into school and get to the server where traditionally you would. You've got the ability not just have whole school with the general channel, but you could have the files which are private to the business manager get stored in their section and this is a bit like having restricted shares on a server that only certain people that are members would be able to see the business manager channel to have the discussions in posts but also they could keep their files in there privately as well this doesn't replace your own area onedrive is the place where you keep your personal files but teams and sharepoint which really files is sharepoint inside of teams Teams as a way to keep communal files that small groups of people or large groups of people need access to. So it could be the admin team want to share some work, and in there, we've got the parent newsletter, and that might be that that's worked on every single week. If you wanted to have templates, it's easy. Just go on, you create that. So it might be look, we've got our templates for various things that we do as an admin team. We'll have a folder there, and we can get all of our templates in there. And then all of the admin staff only can go in and use that in there, but the rest of the staff in the school couldn't get access. So you start to have this additional tool to organise how you want to work as a community, and it can build smaller communities within the global school community or within a trust community. What you could also have, if I dip over, because I know I have got some schools attending from a trust perspective, you could have a general channel where maybe uh, COO, CEOs, trust level uh, teams could come into, but also could be leadership teams from the individual schools or academies. And then you can have your notifications in there. But additionally, you could have central trust teams like finance, operations, strategy. They could all have their separate areas. And then, for instance, the trust finance could have the business managers from each of the schools and academies linked up. And that gives you another community to network within. And then finally, the governors, you would tend to have the general channel for the whole governors meetings or whole governors business. And then you'd have separate subcommittees where you join those governors into their subcommittee so they could be in there. So if you needed to have a subcommittee meeting, you could organize it in the relevant subcommittee. But if you wanted to have a whole governors meeting and it wasn't face to face, you could organize that through the general channel. And you could either call an instant meeting by pressing the meet button at the top or what you can do is you can schedule meetings by in a community clicking on a button like that. It will take you to the calendar. It might be whole governor's meeting. And then anyone else is that's going to be in there will get invited. But you can also have a notification in the governor's channel. But I might want to invite someone specifically. So if I add a member of staff in so I also want to have Jennifer Bridges and I know she's not on there we're asking her to come and speak about an initiative in school and I'm going to send that out I could have put an agenda in here and then away I go if I can type this afternoon uh, and that will then go out to everybody they'll get an invite in their calendar they'll get a message in their inbox but at the same time when I come into the general channel I can see I've got a whole staff meeting or a whole governor's meeting as it is there and that's coming up and it's going to be Tuesday and it's uh, and it's at four o'clock so quite 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 close timing it's only a few minutes away but it is there so you've got all of those different communities that can start to have their own teams usually if for a staff team it's a, when you go to create it is a staff type of team that you pick in teams and then for governors and trust functions it would be PLCs the other type of team to create would be either a class team and you can create class teams for primary classrooms or secondary classrooms. If you're using a secondary classroom, what you would tend to do is organise your channels around a subject. So this might be science and I've got all the different sets for my science sets in a secondary school and then the teachers that teach a particular set are added into that particular channel. So as a teacher, 
of science in a secondary school, I would only see the channels for the sets that I teach. But as maybe the subject coordinator or the faculty lead, I might see all of the sets because I want to dip in and out between those different classes. And then you can use it for the purpose of teaching. In a primary class, what you get is a single channel and you create one class team per physical class in the in the school. So if I was, I don't know, tree class names and year one and two are oak and maple, I would have one team called oak and another team called maple. And then each of the teams would represent a class teacher or teachers if there's a job share, certain LSAs. And then the senior leadership team might have all of those different class teams because you just like you would walk around the school and take a learning walk and walk around the corridors, you would have a look online. You could dip in and out of these class teams as well. So you can attach individual members of staff and give them permission and access as you see fit. With class teams, Microsoft recently last month brought in a home page. It was a new feature and heavily requested. What that is, is it acts as a landing page for anyone who uses it. So it works a bit like for any of you that use SharePoints, like a SharePoint site. And in there, you can direct people to resources that might be stored in files. You can have a calendar for homework that might be due or important events that are whole school or class based. And everything is in there that you might need to glance as a, as a one stop shop for arriving in that class team. You've also got other features that we'll come on to in a minute, but I'm just going to jump back away from the home page down to the general channel. The posts, regardless of whether you're using a staff team or a PLC or a class team, they work in the same way. You can start a new conversation. You can just send a quick message by typing in text, or if you press the A with a pencil, it will give you further options. So you can give it a title. So it might be that we're going to look at the history project. And in the history project, we don't want it to just be announcement. We might want to have a banner there. And then in that banner, we can choose an illustration to draw our attention in. So to make it look a bit more creative, Microsoft also allow you the ability to upload your own picture. It's up to you. And what that does is it draws people's eye in. You wouldn't want to use them all the time, but you would certainly use them sparingly. I think it's having a long think and might just stop that and just use a color so the headline might be uh, visit project because this is going to be related with the project in school and it's uh, make sure you have uh, wellies for the for the trip and what we can do is have that reminder go out to everyone. If I'm working in a class and I don't want people to reply, but I want people just to see it, I could change it from everyone can reply to only me as a moderator. So that means that I can't have comments underneath and I'll scroll up next and show you what comments look like. Also, this might apply if I've got two, three, four entry primary school or multiple subjects in a secondary school, I can post once and I can, a bit like email, CCing people in, I can include other teams. So I might want to turn it on class team to also get this because they are going to be my parallel class. So I can post to the same people at the same time and then I can send it out. There are other options in the bottom that we've looked at in previous sessions, such as you can attach a file, you can insert emojis, you can add giffies if it's relevant, you can give stickers as well. And it tends to be I use stickers as a way of communicating with pupils or students to show them that I'm happy with something or I'm pleased with what they're doing. And if you teach them the way that you're working, that can often be a more efficient way than typing a sentence to each pupil. You can also add in other features. Uh, and we'll look at those in some of the more advanced sessions that will come up later on in this series. And then I simply send it and that will post out into my team, but also it's uh, going to be available in the other team that I've chosen for it to go to. Because I'm the moderator, I have the reply box, but most people don't have the reply box because it'd only be the teachers, the people that are the owners that can reply. What it looks like over time, if you've got a discussion building up, it might be the science project here. So I'm going to response, don't forget to bring your materials. And I'm going to say, our oh, box is OK. And I know that I have posted this, but I could be a pupil. So that comes up and as a member of staff, Whenever I come to check this, I can go in and I can respond as well. This isn't meant to be that you're on call day and night. This is just an area where 
you can get help if you're a student or a pupil outside of school hours or you can go back and you can check on what was going on in school or you've got some connection with the school community even though you are not actually in school at that time the file section at the top allows you to pop in resources that normally support learning or it could be for pastoral reasons if it's tutor time or something the thing you need to remember is don't put your only copy from OneDrive. that these in here are editable if you put something in class materials it's going to be read only so you've got more control over it but if you put your only copy of something in here and it gets overwritten you can roll back there is a feature to get back to the original version but also equally it could be destroyed and it's just thinking about intuitively where is the resource in there you wouldn't use that for day-to-day -day teaching but you might put in certain resources that you're going to come in so maths it might be that you put in there uh, a number square because it's a universal resource that you might want to come to regularly or there might be some sort of spelling sheets that you put in for english so there might be generic resources that are quite useful to put into the file section at the top in the we space we've looked at posts and files and various things you can pin in other aspects so i think i've got a wakelet there which is a third party app that connects with microsoft but if you press the plus button what you will find is that there are other features that you can plug in so if you know that you're going to do quite a bit of work with spreadsheets you could add in excel at the top so it keeps the pupils in the one area in that team's community and saves them wandering off looking for things equally if you wanted them to do a survey on a form you could post the link in posts so that it's there for them to pick up you could add it in a homework but you could pin it to the top and you can then unpin as well it's not there forever so that project that I've got there, I can drop it down and I can remove it when I finish doing that science project so that that selection along the top isn't static, that it refreshes. But if there's something that needs to be there for a long period of time, it can be in one place. When you are running classwork, classwork is through a product called OneNote and there's a particularly specialized version of that called OneNote Class Notebook. Now OneNote Class Notebook is what you would use instead of having an interactive board in your classroom and I and a lot of schools that we work with tend to see the value in no longer using specific board software. So you might have Smart and use Smart Notebook, you might have Promethean, use Active Inspire. Everyone's got their own product. It's a nightmare when you move between jobs. I know I've experienced it when I've taken jobs in different schools working as a teacher, but increasingly it's limited in its nature and it can be quite expensive. It's got a lot of nice features to it, but it can mean that you do a lot of extra work. So by adopting OneNote Class Notebook as your teaching platform, it actually helps with transparency of resources, but also portability of resources, not just between schools but also between the staff in the school the best way to think of one note class notebook is in is a physical analogy is like a lever arch or ring bound folder and then if i open up where that book icon is there i've got sections and pages think of the sections in one note like the cardboard dividers with the tabs that you would have in the real world and then the pages are like the different pages that you could hole punch and put in between those dividing tabs to organize your work. When you've got a OneNote class notebook, which is specifically only in class teams for teaching and learning, you have a collaboration space and the collaboration space is somewhere and I've put in some some subdivider sections in there is where you can put resources where pupils can go and they can pick up the pages that you've got available for them. So in English, if I went into the English one, it might be a page that we're using for a particular reason so it might be although it's not strictly english based we're looking at the history of egypt and i want all of my pupils to be in one page all working together it is a bit daunting the first time you do it but they're all furiously going to be in there talking about various aspects of egypt so in there it's going to be food culture religion and whatever else and they're putting it into one page you might say look i'd like you all to work in a separate page and you have egypt housing egypt food egypt religion and then small groups of pupils each have their own page you need to teach them to be respectful but the collaboration space in the notebook can complement a traditional book and pen and paper providing you've got access to devices. So you might use this only for one project because you've got to book the trolley. You might be fortunate and have the luxury of you're starting to move towards one-to-one -to -one devices, 
but I know with the way that budgets are, the reality is that very often you're dealing with only having access at certain times of a week. So you might choose to use OneNote with the pupils picking up OneNote only for specific occasions. But if you want to get a resource to them, you can put it in the collaboration space, but make them aware they can destroy and overwrite each other's works and they need to be respectful of that. The other area is the content library. The content library is read only for pupils, but I have the ability to edit. So if I wanted to put something in for maths, it might be that I'm going to pop a sheet in there around the properties of 2D shapes. And in there, there's a table I want them to type into about the, the shapes and how many sides or vertices and the name of the shape and so forth. And they could take a copy if they're old enough of that page and then pop it into their own area. Because the other beauty of OneNote Class Notebook is this very small selection of pupils and students I've got at the bottom here. They've each got their own section in the OneNote. Now, I can see all of them because I'm logged in as a teacher, but they would only see their own. They wouldn't see their peers. And then they can break down that into subsections. So they've got the ability, a bit like having a maths book, an English book, a science book, they can keep their pages in the corresponding section to organise their digital work. So the OneNote class notebook becomes like a digital book, except it's far more. Because when you get one of these pages, it's capable, if I collapse the side box there, uh, you can collapse at any time you get a bit more space. It might be that I've got a science test, but it's capable of doing many more things. So we could be we're going to have an investigation about racing cars and we're going to look at aerodynamics and all sorts of things. You can have type text. You could use it for digital link. And this is one reason why I've decided in my teaching I'm getting rid of all that software is I can just have this open on the board at the front. I can maximize the area and get rid of all the teams. But although this sits within teams, I can ink into it. In other words, I can write with my stylus directly onto it, but it's then saved and it's available for the pupils outside of the lesson as well. And I'll talk to you about that again in a bit. But I could add in videos, I could put links to websites. So everything can be on this one blank, endless scrolling canvas. And you can use it quite creatively, but you can also use it to make your, your teaching come to life. Now, I've stopped planning lessons that are just for me and the staff that I work with. And what I plan now are open lessons that I intend the pupils or the students I'm working with to pick up and use on a daily basis. If I'm planning, there's a teachers only section. So pupils or students can see collaboration space and content library, but they can't see teachers only. What I can do is I can plan in here in private to get things ready. So it might be we've got a writing task coming up on Chronicles of Narnia and it's around similes and metaphor and personification. And I'm preparing that sheet. But when I'm ready, I could drop it into the content library. So when I have the lesson, they could pick it up and they could use it or some of the great tools in OneNote Class Notebook, which cuts down in workloads, also means you don't have to visit the photocopier because if they've got access to a device, what you can do is you can distribute that page. So you could distribute it to a group. And if you press the distribute to a group button, you can send it out to a whole class group. So I've created by saying new group, I've created whole class. Any point in time, I can edit that class, I can name it, I can tick and untick people so I can decide who is in my whole class. Or I might have for intervention reasons, I might have a, a group that I'm targeting because I want to give them extra help or I want to extend their learning. So I could say I want to give it to my English extension group. I go to next. I want this to go into their English section of their individual folders and I press distribute and it will go out and it will automatically end up in their area and that will happen in a matter of seconds. Or I could distribute individually. So a pupil comes up to me in a lesson or says I'd like something to add to what I'm doing or I'm finding this too challenging. Have you got anything else? If you happen to have a differentiated resource. So that's Henry that's come up. I could go next. I could say, OK, Henry, there's something coming out to you. If you pop back to your desk, it's going to be there. Or if you're talking to me across the class, press distribute and it will end up straight in his English folder. And a bit like taking a, a physical paper worksheet, he would then get a copy of this. He didn't have to take a copy from the content library anymore because I can send it directly to him and then he can carry on working. But what I could do is go to Henry's English folder 
then I could have a look at what he's doing. He hasn't got the writing task. I haven't distributed it to him, but he might have been working on the Hobbit 500 words. And I could, I could say, hold on a minute. I don't think you're quite there with the Hobbit, but you've got some scope to, to get work out and distribute it easily. We do have a whole separate training module on OneNote Class Note because it's quite big, but the day-to-day -day teaching tool is OneNote Class Notebook, which sits, if I minimise OneNote here, right inside of Teams because it's in one of the Wii spaces. I spoke about planning open lessons. I'll show you an example I've got in a secondary. So if I went to the Class Notebook in here and imagine I've got my year sevens for the first time, and we're starting off with cells and we're going to look in one of our first units of work that we're undertaking at cells. The type of open lesson planning I might do in OneNote class notebook. If I expand that and I go into here, uh, I think it's in biology. I create a lesson where it's not just for me, it's for them as well. So if I looked at this and collapse that down, I've got a welcome to cells. I've got some level type descriptors which tell me for emerging expected exceeding and mastery what i'm looking for so there's transparency for them uh, i've got the arrows to visually prompt but it's not fixed so i've used some animated gifs and then we're going to look at the different sections of a cell the cytoplasm what happens there the chloroplast and the nucleus we scroll across again and lesson one is about sections of the different cells because i'm using one note, I can have tick boxes to say, well, those sections are in an animal cell, those sections are in a plant cell. We can move over again. I can embed other apps from Office 365, so I could have a quiz that's self-marking in here about uh, cells. That means I've got less workload, but there's also things like accessibility. So I could turn on immersive reader and then I don't have to produce different resources in different languages or for different learning needs. I can have that adapted by pupils and students switching on immersive reader directly inside of OneNote. And then they get to the end of lesson one, which is combined with some live teaching as maybe we've made a cells, a slide cheek cells or onion cells, and they pause there and then we go on to lesson two. But what I mean about this being open planning is that you can use Teams for very much hybrid learning. So in the, the next section, in the final section we're going to look at, if I went back to my teams, you can use assignments to set homework. But what you can have is your pupils to go back and pick up what they were doing in class because the book isn't in class. They can get to their work outside of the classroom and they can view the work that they were doing in class to support them with completing a homework or parents can have a look and they can get a better understanding and support the child, but in turn support you as a teacher or support the school. And it just breaks down the barriers between in school learning and out of school learning and makes all of those resources more available. So I now plan everything I do and everything I deliver is in OneNote class notebook. And I don't use it with pupils that often because I haven't got the luxury of having one to one devices. They only use OneNote sparingly. But they do know that when they come into their class team with me, that they can always get back to their teaching for the day because they can go to the content library, which is where I always put my resources afterwards and is organized by weeks or subjects. It does vary by school, but they can go back and they can look exactly what we did on any given day, on any given week at a term, and they can see it there. But also my colleagues could come and borrow those pages so it cuts down on workflows. Also, leadership teams could dip in and see what you've been doing for continuity across the school, levels of challenge and so forth. So it just makes it easier to work collaboratively by keeping things in that OneNote and using OneNote class notebook as your classroom tool. Homework can be delivered through assignments. So what you can do is you can create an assignment or a quiz. So it might be here that I've got one on 2D shapes. This one is live. I can see all of the pupils I've assigned it to and I can see whether it's been handed in or not. So if I went to some class reading, uh, there is a full set of class reading. Now, class reading is something that's been difficult in the past because you've got a reading record. But how do you know that they're doing it? Well, you can have that checked and see exactly if your work has been handed in or not. So with the class reading exercise, it could be that you click on an individual pupil and you can see if they've turned their work in. What that looks like if I look at a uh, if I look at something I've been drafting, so I might have a reading task here. If 
by going to my reading task, I can give things a title. So I just type, I can also tag it. So though it's English, I might divvy up between reading, writing and so forth. I can then use the bullet points to give it instructions. Uh, and you can also include links and pictures in here, so it's pretty interactive. But then you can attach resources. They could be uploaded from your computer, they can be in various forms, and you could use features inside of assignments such as reading progress, where if they're doing reading at home, they can read as a video and you can see the video of the people reading, but you can also then pick up whether they are jumping words, fluency and then you might use that for um for inside of class and picking things up again you can have points attached to it but you don't have to so i might use that occasionally if i'm maybe in year six and we're prepping for sats you could also have a rubric which just which here i've got the terms hot mild and spicy so we can give success criteria around a particular area uh, and that can help the pupils or the parents understand what they need to turn in and the way of work. You can assign it to just your class, a bit like posting or multiple classes. You just tick them in there and you decide whether the whole class gets it or just particular students and then set a deadline for it to be in. So the deadline is, is passed on this one, but if I need to update it, because actually I drafted this ages ago and I want this to be in sometime next week or next time, we might say it's going to be in Friday the 4th of November. I can assign it straight away or I can save it again and I can come back to it. So I can draft these in private. Then I've got the ones that are returned. So I've had two homeworks returned to me, but I can see the ones that are assigned and the ones that are live, and then they're available in there for me to see and for me to check in. And if I ever want to see what a pupil has been doing, I can click on them and had they handed in their work, it would appear here on the left. And then I can give feedback individually on the side there and it will allow me to communicate one to one privately. They can get feedback and the whole of the class don't see it, but it then gives me another vehicle to keeping track of my homework. As a teacher, I have got in there my grades. So what I can see a bit like having a mark book online is exactly what I've given might be needs revision and I can export that if I want to and I can export that in Excel or I can keep my grade book online so that I can see all of my different assignments or pieces of homework. So you can use assignments for homework, but it's certainly that's meant for those fixed pieces of learning with a deadline. So I'm going to check back and see if there's any questions before we flip over and I'll give you the code for today's session. No, OK, so today is a flavour of what you could possibly use Teams for for communities, but it's really the possibilities are endless and it's just thinking about how it best fits with where you are and what you're currently doing. And then with that, making sure that all the staff feel confident in doing so and also that you've got all the pupils with you and you've got the parents with you as well. But what are the 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 possibilities teams offer you is the ability to tap into different bits and pieces as and when you wish to. I've promised you a code, so the code to redeem in Microsoft Learn is on screen now, and that code is something that you can take to Microsoft Learn. So if I go ahead to the next screen, the code is in the top right hand corner. Don't worry, it hasn't disappeared. So that is 59LR4X and it will remain live after this session. So if you're watching this as a recording, you can still redeem it. You go to Learn. You Once you're signed in, in the middle where I've got that yellow circle, click redeem code now and then you pop that code into the box and you'll be accredited for undertaking some Teams learning. And it will also give you the opportunity to have a look around and see if there's any other areas that you would think are of interest to you that you can use. As far as more ideas, we are constantly posting on Twitter and also LinkedIn, so do follow us on there. If you've got any questions outside of this session, you can always email office at turnon.co.uk and we would really value your feedback so you can scan the QR code on screen with your mobile device. It will take you into a quick form. It's only got five questions on there and you can then leave us some feedback. 
and we will once we've edited this this chat will stay in your conversation history and teams and in the next day or so we'll post the link to this recording so the recording that will show up instantly at the end of the meeting will not be accessible because it's only available to internal turn it on employees but we'll put a edited youtube link in the chat in the next few days and you'll be able to get that watch it back yourself but also share with colleagues if you need to